As we navigate an era of unprecedented global challenges, the role of international organizations like the United Nations has never been more crucial. From climate change and ecological resilience to poverty reduction and sustainable development, the UN's efforts are pivotal in shaping a better future for all. Tonight, we are honored to have with us three distinguished guests from the United Nations who are at the forefront of these global initiatives. Joining us is Dr. Dennis Zulu, the United Nations resident coordinator with over two decades of experience in developmental work, and Mr. Kishan Koda, the UNDP resident representative, along with Mr. Crispin Hall. He's the associate protection officer at UNHCR. Together, these leaders will provide us with invaluable insights into the UN's regional efforts and the transformative impact of their initiatives. Stay with us. Our show begins on the other side of this break. In our show tonight, we are delighted to have Mr. Dennis Zulu, the United Nations Resident Coordinator, along with Mr. Kishan Kode, the United Nations Development Program Resident Representative, and Mr. Crispin Hall, the Protection Officer at UNHCR, the United Nations Refugee Agency. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank uh, there are a lot of big, long titles, so that's, that, that's the most complex I expect for us to be today. So let's, first of all, uh, start by explaining what your individual roles are uh, with the United Nations and the, and, and the functions that, that you play. Right, and thanks for having us. Um, my role, as you clearly articulated, is United Nations Resident Coordinator. Now, over the years and in the past, the, the United Nations, which is, you know, comprises of a number of agencies, uh, would operate in, in a country um, and the different agencies would go about their business and implementing their programs. Um, this, I think, was seen uh, at the time that uh, th there was need for some coordination because we had instances where, for instance, you get different agencies sort of getting into each other's way, if you want, but also because some mandates actually sometimes overflow into other areas. So it was decided as uh, as part of the UN reform process that we look and seek a way of, of better coordination, um, have somebody in country who would be able to look at and, and facilitate and coordinate the work of the different agencies uh, and ensure that those coherence and integration in the programs. Hence the decision to have a resident coordinator. So my role really is to oversee the operations of, of the different agencies that work in any individual country. We've got similar colleagues in, in 120 countries across the world. Um, I'm appointed directly by the Secretary General of the United Nations, and therefore I am the representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations at the country level. Um, and um, as I explained earlier on, really, um, the United Nations implements uh, programs in, in country, uh, working very closely with my colleagues who head the individual agencies. We normally implement within one program uh, where all the agencies contribute to. Um, so that also reflects what I do, really seeing that and ensuring that the agencies are implementing what's on the program, but also providing a voice in terms of the UN to the country, uh, um, basically ensuring that they, there's coherency, this, this, the message is, is consistent. We're going to talk definitely forward. about the UN voice yeah. a little bit more in country, yeah. Mr. Kode, you, your, your role? Right. Thank you again for having us. Uh, United Nations Development Program, we've had our framework uh, cooperation agreement with Bahamas for almost 50 years. 
we're nearing our 50th anniversary. And over the years, we've focused on really building local capacities for achieving the country's development goals. And today, that focuses on things such as um, advancing social inclusion, which includes things like women's empowerment, um, young entrepreneurs, etc. A big focus also on combating the planetary crisis, things like climate change, uh, adapting to climate change, uh, building resilience to natural disasters, um, building resilience of ecosystems, coral reefs and other ecosystems that are critical to the Bahamas and other parts of the Caribbean. And lastly, on enhancing capacities for governance, um, including things like regulatory reform, um, upstream national policies on development as we advance towards the 2030 targets under the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, closing the gap on achievement across the Caribbean, including Bahamas, um, and uh, various other topics that are priorities of the, of the government and the wow. communities we serve. Thank you much. Now, Crispin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Jerome. Thank, Thank you for having us. Yes, yes, my name, my name is, is Crispin, Crispin Hall. I am a protection officer with the United Nations um, High Commission for Refugees. I'm based here in the Bahamas, but our multi-country office is based in Washington, D.C. Um, the Bahamas is signatory, Jerome, to the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees, and it's been a signatory for over 30 years now, since 1993. And UNHCR has been present physically in the Bahamas since 2014, and in my capacity as a protection officer, um, UNHCR assists the government of the Bahamas with supporting them in terms of their capacity to, to respond on various pillars, whether that's human mobility with regards to forcibly displaced persons, stateless individuals, and then also internal displacement due to climate change. So um, we really have set the stage for a, a massive discussion uh, here this evening, but I want to, to narrow it first of all to talk really about um, you know, how does the Bahamas uh, fit into the United Nations? And I ask that because many, many times, um, and, and it's not just a, a thing that's for Bahamians, people don't understand um, what it is or how their country fits into the work of the United Nations. And, you know, as, as a media uh, person and someone who loves news, you always hear and see the big nations going back and forth at the yeah. UN. Uh, but you all, you know, a lot of times we're left to wonder, well, where do we fit in? Mm -hmm. and, and what's the role of the Bahamas and how is it relevant to us? Yeah. All right, the, the Bahamas uh, is a member of the United Nations and the United Nations really is, is, is a gathering of member states across the world. Um, so we have what is commonly referred to as a General Assembly. This is where the member states come and meet and discuss global issues and agree on global issues. Um, and that's usually where we see our foreign minister exactly. speak at the General well, Assembly. Actually, not just the foreign minister, the head of state normally sits. Yes, uh, that's sits true. Yes. In, mm -hmm. in, in the General Assembly. We have an upcoming meeting in September um, where the heads of states will come, uh, supported obviously by their foreign ministers, uh, to discuss global issues. Uh, aside from the General Assembly, what has become very uh, popular and, and common known now as, as the uh, Security Council. Uh, the Security Council consists of, of, of member states, five permanent members, and, and the other members, I think 12 of them, are elected on a rotational basis. Uh, and the Security Council deals with contentious issues and, and takes votes there. Um, and um, some of the members, the, what we call the P5, have veto power. So um, if something is, is tabled and one of the five believe that this is not in interest for whatever reason, they have the power to veto, which basically means that the, there's no agreement and that, that decision will be carried. And we sometimes hear that, uh, or we see that really rise to the top in, in, in within the news cycle. Such exactly. and such country has vetoed a the veto. UN that's very true, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have the General Assembly and the Security Council, but supporting these, 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 these institutions is the Secretariat, which is where we belong as, as the as a technical and, and official, this, the international civil servants who support this. Now, within the Secretariat, there are persons who work and support both the Secretary Council and the General Assembly. And aligned to the Secretariat is where we have now the UN agencies and where my colleagues come from, UNDP, UNHCR, ILO, WFP, you can name them. They all are different funds and programs that now actually support the implementations of, of different programs at the country level. Now, the Bahamas is represented at, uh, at the General Assembly, as you said, by the head of state, the prime minister, but also benefits from the programs that are implemented at country level, which my colleagues alluded to. Um, and of course, uh, as, as, a, as a critical member of the, of the United Nations, the uh, Bahamas has a say in, in uh, the discussions and 
the determination of outcomes uh, through its vote on the General Assembly. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, it has an important role to, to play in the, in the United Nations. And, and we're actually delighted with the fact that uh, the Bahamas has reiterated its, its commitment to multilateralism because we mm-hmm. believe that uh, major decisions, uh, global decisions, can only be taken with the consensus of the majority of the member states, with the Bahamas being one of them. I want to talk about your Deliver as One initiative yeah. um, and what that is about and explain to us how how the Bahamas fits into that. All right. So as, I, as we started off by saying that uh, the United Nations um, comprises of different agencies and my colleagues are from two of those agencies. Uh, as I said before, when you have a situation where you have different agencies in country, we've got five, uh, I think five resident agencies in, in the Bahamas with other supporting programs from outside who we call non-resident agencies. It's important that we're all delivering um, with one program because it's very easy for each one of them to do their own thing. So as part of the reform, uh, it was decided that at every country there'll be one program. In the case of the Bahamas, we have what is called a, a multi-country sustainable development framework, which is a regional plan uh, in the Caribbean. But within that, there's a country implementation plan, which is specific to the Bahamas and highlights the priorities of the Bahamas. So each one of the agencies is supposed to buy into this program. And this program is designed with uh, the participation uh, of the government, and it's supposed to feed into the priorities as determined by the government. So it's really demand driven. So we're moving away from a situation where we would come in as UN agencies. And I think there's been some criticism sometimes that sometimes the union would come and do what they want. But with one program, the program is anchored on the National Development Plan, but also more importantly, it also reflects and is aligned with the Sustainable Development Goals, which as you know, is the global agenda uh, for 2030. I'd like to talk to you gentlemen individually about some of the programs that, that you're working on that are uh, existing here and the effectiveness of them, because you know, I, many times I see here and I say to guests, having a program or is one thing, but let's talk about the effectiveness of it and are people really benefiting from it? Absolutely. Yes, I mean, there's definitely been a series of programs over the years, as I said, over the decades. And so different times, different contexts, different needs, uh, different requests for support uh, from the government and the country to the United Nations. So at the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, we've had a, a string of very important programs over the years. Um, just to give an example, um, after Hurricane Dorian um, hit uh, both Bahamas and Turks uh, and Caicos Islands uh, about five years ago, um, we, along with many others, provided support in terms of their recovery. Um, and so we have an ongoing program the last five years, in fact, with the authority, the disaster authority, local communities, Abaco and elsewhere, uh, in terms of actually recovering uh, community livelihoods, services, um, in the initial onset a few years ago, of course, but also, more importantly, building up shelters locally on higher ground and stronger for looking ahead to the next, uh, which unfortunately, as we know this year, is a, is a serious a series of hurricanes, uh, hurricane season this year. Um, and so we're hoping that that can help prevent um, loss of life, uh, loss of livelihoods and damage um, in Abaco and other parts of the country. And that's important also in terms of developing broader capacities um, as the national policy evolves on ways to build disaster prevention and recovery in an integrated way. We also have related programming emerging on climate change, climate adaptation, climate resilient food systems, parts of the country, important work on um, biodiversity and corals, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of really scaling up action. Uh, these were some of the key items at the recent um, SIDS4 conference uh, that took place in the region which is really an important uh, platform for SIDS countries, Bahamas and, and the rest of the Caribbean and globally, where to put forward their agenda globally. Um, and that's a very important voice on many of these kind of issues. Good stuff. And, and you know, I think sometimes the work that is being done is lost um, on the public because you're talking about things uh, that have to do with the sustainability of the country. When you're talking about preserving coral reefs, when you're talking about building shelters uh, in areas that are that are safer. These are the things that are happening day to day, I think, that Joe Public mm. uh, does not realize because you don't, mm. you know, it's not something that's tangible to us every day. We sort of look up, you see something or you see people moving around without understanding really what's happening. Well, that's my little commentary. I'm going to, Crispin, let's talk about some of the programs you're working on indeed, in country. Indeed, Jerome. So from UNHCR's perspective, we work with the government of the Bahamas to sort of support them. Right. And the adherence to the convention, like I mentioned earlier. Um, on multiple, multiple pillars, we operate. On asylum, we work closely with the Office of the Attorney General. 
we work closely with the Ministry of Foreign, of Foreign Affairs to draft legislation um, to and create a protective environment um, for those persons who are seeking asylum. So why is that important? I've got to ask when you're drafting legislation. Why, why is it important for your agency to have input? So, so this, 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 this agency, UNHCR, has the mandate to protect refugees and asylum seekers coming into the country. So we are the expertise, we are the experts, so we have the expertise where we're able to lend the government in that regard to ensure that it's in alignment with international standards and the highest international protocols. So it's not that we just come in and set up our own uh, laws and, and, and uh, set up our own legislation which is outside of UN Indeed, we ensure that it's best practice. Okay. All right. And uh, Mr. Zulu, how, you know, why are these, we, we talk, we hear about these individual programs and how, you know, we are benefiting from them. But why is that so important to the UN? Why is it, because people will ask, well, why would the UN even care? Why would they care what happens in country? But why is that so important to the overall mandate of the United Nations, particularly when we're talking about those sustainable goals? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I mean, the Bahamas as it is is part of of uh, the League of Nations and and therefore uh, someone did say that when when for instance there's poverty in one place it's poverty will there's poverty elsewhere sure. um, and and of course the um, the goal of the United Nations is ensure that this sustainable growth and, and there's the uh, poverty education and all those are addressed and and what we do in in terms of having the sustainable one goes is placing a standard so this is a standard the global standard which we want all countries in the world to be able to meet. And, and for that to happen, we are therefore uh, available and like my colleagues say, provide the needed technical assistance. And in some cases, some, some little funding to be able to support government in, in their, in their, in their, in their work so that they're able to achieve at minimum what is pertaining elsewhere. So the global uh, standards are set by the sustainable goals are those that we need to aspire to as a country in the case of the Bahamas. And as the United Nations is that organization that supports um, uh, technically and, and programmatically, it's important therefore that uh, the Bahamas is a member of the United Nations, but also it's important that uh, being a member of the organizations gives it certain uh, rights uh, and, and privileges, uh, i.e. technical support that we need to provide for them to be able to overcome some of the developmental challenges that they may face. I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you said setting the standards. Yeah. And that is so important mm -hmm. uh, so that we are uh, maintaining uh, global, global standards, standards and yeah. that's so very important. Mm -hmm. So gentlemen, we have a lot more to talk about. Our aim tonight is really to help our audience to understand the work of the United Nations and what they are doing in the Bahamas when we come back more on the current and future plans. This is On The Record. We'll be back. All right, and welcome back. We are still here with an esteemed panel from the United Nations, each of them uh, having a very crucial role uh, for the work of the United Nations here in the Bahamas. And tonight we're attempting to understand a lot better what the United Nations does in the Bahamas. Uh, one of the, I guess, critical um, questions I'm sure that a lot of our viewers have on their minds, uh, how does the UN support economic development? I think we spent a, a fair amount of time talking about you know, what you're doing in various areas, dealing with you know, uh, refugees, refugees and, and migrants and uh, many develop, other developmental goals, climate change a little. But when you talk about economic development, those are dollars and cents issues that people are looking at every day. So how does your organization assist, particularly in areas of poverty reduction, health care and even education? Well, I mean, th that's that's basically what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and we do that through uh, the different specialized agencies that work in these areas. Uh, so if you're talking about health, for instance, we have PAHO WHO, who are, who are specialized staff and, and programs that are directed to health. It's education, we've got UNESCO and UNICEF, 
all okay. directing their efforts towards supporting member states like the Bahamas in, in issues of education, but also education for children. Uh, when you have labor issues, employment issues, very critical for the economic development of, of any country, we have the International Labor Organization that helps at policy and, and programmatic levels. Uh, when you talk about climate, United Nations Environmental Program. Um, so I can go on and on. So we have uh, very, very many agencies that are all uh, incapacitated, but also are very technically sound in, in being able to deliver programs um, at the country level that support economic development. And, and one thing that we also support, which is very critical, is, is, is data. Um, mm. Data is very important for planning and, and, and programming. So working with the different uh, statistical institutions across the world, we help build capacities of these institutions so that they can produce timely data, reliable data. That's very important, not just for the United Nations, but also for member states. Um, but when you talk about economic development, one thing which we bear in mind also is the fact that they, the Caribbean broadly is, is, is vulnerable to, to climate change. And one of the impacts of climate change is what we're seeing in Jamaica at the moment, which is the uh, Hurricane Dorian. So as the United Nations, we, we support uh, the humanitarian effort uh, to get the countries recovering. We did the same in the Bahamas after Dorian. Uh, we just started doing the same in Jamaica, where, where I had the humanitarian recovery effort and my colleague, um, uh, Kishan is responsible for UNDP who have a major role in, in supporting recovery, both economically, uh, but also in other spheres of, of the work that we do. So we, we are there really to support uh, member states because I think with economic development, then you have, you have, um, a, a platform for, for attaining other things that come with it. Uh, but let me just end by saying, I think for us, Having a framework such as the Sustainable Development Goals, which captures all the aspects of development, uh, is important because it keeps us the eye, the eye on the ball. Uh, sure. As was talked about earlier on, you have a global standard that you need to aspire to. Um, SDG 1 on poverty is, is critical because it's part of ensuring economic and equitable growth. So we, we work with that, working with government to improve policy, to improve programs. Uh, and leaving no one behind because that's very important when addressing uh, poverty. Make sure the person, the people with disability, women, youths, and all other groups are within uh, the remit of programs that are being implemented. You know, you named uh, or, or you reminded us of some of those agencies that we talk about, um, and I think sometimes forget that they're UN agencies. Mm -hmm. PAHO, which mm -hmm. played a significant role during the COVID-19 mm -hmm. crisis. I think we were talking to PAHO Probably every other day, it mm -hmm. seemed, you know, at some point, mm -hmm. when you talk about UNESCO and UNICEF. Mm -hmm. and, and so in the moment, as you said those, I thought, oh, wow, yes. <laughs> Sometimes we yeah, forget, we forget that these all yeah. come under, you know, the, the United Nations umbrella. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk a little bit, though, about uh, addressing climate change mm -hmm. in the Bahamas. I mean, we are in the midst of a very busy hurricane season um, where we expect, uh, you know, to, to face a lot of storms. We would have just experienced, you know, five years is not a long time mm -hmm. uh, when you talk about recovering from a storm. So in many instances, we're still recovering from a Dorian. Yeah. Um, but I want to talk about really how the UN is working uh, with us to, to look at those, uh, you know, high vulnerability areas and the, and the areas where we can stand to improve, mm -hmm. um, particularly as we face so much from the, from the changing climate. No, I'm, I'm glad that you raised that issue. Um, it's indeed a climate emergency, as the United Nations Secretary General has called repeatedly in, in recent years to all member states, both developed and developing countries. Um, we are in the midst of a climate emergency. In men, for many communities globally, it's, um, it's a, a life and death issue. It's, um, it's livelihoods, yes, but it's also uh, a really an issue of loss of uh, economic assets and capacities. Um, uh, social services, as we're seeing um, already at the start of the hurricane season. As we've seen this year, um, as the ocean heats up owing to climate change and reach, reaches record levels in recent years, this is really catalyzing a change of the season, hurricane seasons. And so this year in particular, we're seeing the strongest uh, uh, hurricanes at this part of the year in, in July. The first, yeah, the f I mean, uh, early on, and we've got a monster storm, a monster already, which is unprecedented. Is just the first in, in uh, possibly up to 20 uh, in the hurricane season this year. Um, so then what do we do about it? And so the focus really is on, you know, those national climate plans 
that countries have put forward under the Paris Agreement. Um, and we've put ourselves forward as the United Nations Development Program in concert with others such as the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, and many others, WHO and many others across the whole system. It's a system-wide effort from the United Nations really to build capacities, put in place the policies for adapting to climate change in key sectors such as food, water, health, um, but also to uh, expand you know, uh, infrastructure in disaster-prone areas. So those hotspots where we'll need to expand shelters, where we'll need to expand early warning systems in particular so that we can take advanced measures well in advance of impact. And indeed, where we can have early recovery and climate resilient recovery in a sense so that the recovery efforts that do take place can actually, in a way, uh, put the country in a place where it's better prepared for the next cycle after. And so some of our initiatives in Bahamas, for example, on things like um, disaster prevention and recovery with the disaster authority, uh, but also on climate resilient food systems that's getting going, I would think an important part is also in terms of the policies around on the fiscal space in terms of what we were discussing. So we cooperate closely with the Ministry of Social Services in terms of um, uh, building capacities, for example, of SMEs on livelihoods to be able to bounce back from crises. This has been a very important par uh, program, United States Development Program led by the UN Women Program also mm -hmm. called Build Back Equal the last few years after COVID to really build the capacity of SMEs since they form such an important part of the economy and local lobbyists. Mr. Zula, I know you've got to get to another engagement, so we're going to excuse you in just a bit. So I'm going to give you the final question okay. in this segment, though, but don't worry, i got lots more to talk about <laughs> with you guys. Uh, what a, I want to look to the future. If you could give us a glimpse into the UN's future plans, your visions, next steps okay. uh, for goals and continued support and development in the bomb. All right. Okay. So the first thing, which I think is a very important uh, development, is the opening up over the office of the High Commission for Human Rights in the Bahamas. And this will be a regional office of the United Nations looking at the issues of human rights. Uh, we're totally delighted that they, the Bahamas offered to host this very important office because it's, you know, human rights issues, are, human rights issues everyday issues. Nice. Uh, so we'll be... Um, opening this office sometime during the year, uh, which will be staffed with various experts, but not just serving the Bahamas, but also serving the region, the Caribbean region uh, as a whole. So for us, that's a very important development. Uh, in September this year, we have what we call at the general, post the General Assembly, which is held every September, we're going to have what is called the Summit for the Future. Uh, we know that the, the Sustainable Development Goals go up to 2030. Uh, so it has been decided that we cannot wait till 2030 to start planning for the future. Mm -hmm. So what happens after 2030 in the SDGs? So this is what uh, um, uh, member states will be discussing um, uh, and reflecting what has happened thus far, but also planning uh, for the next generation. And, and uh, when we talk about the next generation, we're only talking about those who are not even born yet. Because we believe that the, the world has an obligation uh, to ensure that what we leave behind is, is that which will facilitate uh, a safer uh, a planet going forward. So we're working at the moment with, with many governments, and I'm delighted to state here that the, um, the government of the Bahamas has already started preparing for the summit of the future. Um, and we hope to get a good representation. Uh, from the Bahamas, because we, you have a very big, important role to play uh, in in this League of Nations. Uh, so that's one. But also, we also look into what's strengthening the capacities of the different agencies in the Bahamas. Uh, we have more agencies opening up full strength. Uh, we're looking towards UNHCR, for instance, to increasing the number of staff in this country. FAO have already indicated that they they're, they're ramping up their presence uh, in the same way IOM, International Organization of Migration. So it's, it's looking up, it's very positive, and um, uh, we, we look forward to being that partner, that credible partner um, that the Bahamas uh, desires us to be, and uh, we want to be part of, of the Bahamas' success and, and the future. Uh, certainly looking forward to it when you talk about a summit for the fu of the future. Mm. That inspires me because it tells me that we are already forward thinking, and far too often mm. uh, we wait till we're in the now crises. <laughs> Yeah. to begin to look for answers. So it's good to hear that. I'm excited to hear more about mm -hmm. the opening of the UNHCR office. Voice, yeah. The Office of the High Commission. Office of the High Human Commission. Human Rights. All right, yeah. Human Rights Office. Yeah. That's this what is, we can talk yeah. about. <laughs> All <laughs> right, perfect. I knew you've got to go. Dennis <laughs> yeah. Yulu, thank you for stopping thank by. You so keep much. up the great work. Uh, we'll certainly keep in contact. All the best to you. And mm -hmm. continue to 
to do the great work uh, with the Bahamas, you know, I know that sometimes you think it's a thankless job. I don't have to tell no, you no, a lot. No, it's not. I know. <laughs> but we do appreciate what you do. No, Thank you so very much. Gentlemen, we've got more to talk about. Okay. Stay with us. We've got more to come with our United Nations team right on the other side of this break. Stay with us. Welcome back to our final segment. In this segment, we are still with Mr. Hishan Kode and Mr. Crispin Hall. We've talked, um, gentlemen, about a lot of work that's being done in country. But I know, as with anything else, there are some challenges. So I do want to talk about some of the challenges that you face in country um, and whether they're unique to the Bahamas. Right. Well, I mean, uh, definitely one of the challenges we face is to connect um, our local activities with the broader agenda taking shape in the region. You know, the, the SIDS4 uh, conference that took place in Antigua not long ago set the next 10-year action plan mm -hmm. for SIDS globally. And so moving ahead with that action plan now, um, you know, bringing together countries across the Caribbean on a common vision for taking forward our programming. So from... Just for the, for the benefit of our, our audience, when you say SIDS, it's small island developing correct. states. Correct, 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 correct. correct. Mm -hmm. It's a very important grouping within the broader United Nations family in terms of being among the most vulnerable countries, island states, globally when it comes in particular to climate and disasters, but I would say also uh, on the fiscal agenda in terms of um, addressing those high levels of debt that many small island nations face globally. And so trying to address these issues with a level of commonality across the Caribbean and bringing forth that kind of, uh, bringing forth that kind of um, common vision. Um, I think is something that we work very closely with CARICOM on, and we try to uh, connect our the initiatives that are taking place in the Bahamas. Uh, we're also doing similar initiatives in many times in other neighboring countries, such as in Jamaica and Belize, um, even in some of the territories such as Bermuda uh, and further east in the Caribbean. So really ensuring that connectivity also across the across the region. Uh, as we went into the break, we uh, heard from Mr. Zulu that uh, the UN is getting ready to open. Um, the Office for uh, Human Rights, correct? Correct. correct. Um, which is very different from what you do. Correct. And I want you to help the audience to understand the difference, because as you pointed out, sometimes there is a, a natural tendency to think that the two are the same. Right. So the organization that Mr. Zulu referred to has sort of a broader mandate, whereas with UNHCR, our mandate is more specific. As I mentioned, we work closely with asylum seekers, refugees, stateless individuals, and internally displaced. And um, just to answer the question which you asked earlier about challenges, I think for UNHCR, the challenge is obviously, and you know very well, Jerome, that human mobility, migration, is mm -hmm. something that's very, not, not only in the Bahamas, it's sensitive across the oh, world. Oh yeah, it's a global issue. It's a global issue. Yeah. So working in that context is a challenging context for us to operate in. So I think that's, that's one of the challenges. I want to talk a little bit as well about um, the issue of biodiversity and reef resilience. Uh, these are things that are very important to us and very close um, to a large segment of our population. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's really a um, what we call an ecological safety net. You know, we often think of the, the social safety net that um, provides support at times of crisis. Um, you know, when people face employment challenges, there's that social safety net or where people face health crises or health challenges. There's in many ways, critical ecosystems such as corals play that role. Also, um, when we think about livelihoods that fishermen rely on, um, the corals are the rainforests of the ocean and mm -hmm. therefore there's so much of the ecosystem that revolves around their health. Um, in countries across the Caribbean, of course, tourism is such a big part of the of the economy, and therefore, uh, it also brings risks to the to the broader macro economy. Um, when we're looking at trends of degraded coral reefs, which have really accelerated in recent years, owing to the warmer oceans because of climate change, also because of increasing pollution. So we talk at the United Nations about the triple planetary crisis of climate change, loss of biodiversity, and increase of toxic pollution. 
And the Caribbean really is facing this triple planetary crisis. It's at the forefront, I would say, of it. So a big part of our work at the United Nations Development Program is putting forward um, cooperation programming that can actually help build the resilience of the coral systems themselves, the ecosystems, but also the communities around them in terms of livelihoods. And if we look to the future, I would say this is indeed one of the greatest challenges for uh, small island development states and the Bahamas in particular as one of the lowest lying um, small island states globally. So this is a, a core part of our agenda going forward is try to scale up our assistance to Bahamas in this area. As the world continues to face um, hotspots and, and different crises elsewhere, uh, people move. They try to escape. They try to look for a better way of life. Um, they try to hit the reset button on life. And so they migrate um, or they come looking for asylum. Are we seeing uh, an increase in the requests? Are we seeing, and I want to take sort of the, the, um, the, the legacy issues of migration off the table for a moment, because we do know that we have some longstanding issues uh, with our neighbors um, in Haiti. But outside of that, are we seeing um, the requests for asylum? Are we seeing um, instances where people are migrating? Are we seeing that increase in this instance? coming to the Bahamas. Indeed, we have been seeing an increase, um, obviously due to the global context, as you mentioned before. Countries around the world are sort of restricting their borders. So to borrow the words of the, the High Commissioner, the right to seek asylum is under threat at this time. Um, and it's a threat due to countries tightening their border as a response to activities that we're seeing occurring around us. But I think what's incumbent upon UNHCR and what we and what we do to support governments to provide solutions, not only for countries that are signatories to the convention, but contextually we provide solutions um, regionally as well. And I think for us, the most important distinction that needs to be made is asylum seekers, it's a life or death situation. They are forced to flee. And often what gets lost in the narrative is asylum versus migration, migrants. And mm -hmm. I think for us is to sensitize the, the public and to come on in forums like this to speak to those distinct differences and the nuances, because it is the conversation and the narrative can be a matter of, like I said, life or death for persons. So those asylum seekers are, like you said, really looking, they're running for their lives. They're running from their lives. The, the 1951 convention defines specifically what's an asylum seeker and an individual or defined specifically what is a refugee. So an individual comes into the country originally as an asylum seeker. That individual is then RSD. RSD speaks to refugee status determination. So what UNHCR does is we support the government in being able to provide experts within the Department of Immigration with the ability to assess an individual to determine whether this person has, and the convention speaks to, a credible fear, a credible fear of harm or death due to violence, conflict, or persecution. And that credible fear can be the result of many things, eh? Many Not things. just a war or a political upheaval. Indeed, indeed, Joel. Interesting. How much technical assistance do you provide? Uh, and I, I say that because you talk about a lot of the programs and things that you're helping with, uh, but that technical assistance is, all, is oftentimes lacking uh, in small countries. One, we just don't have the population. Uh, sometimes, you know, these are, uh, as, as I guess as the world e evolves, there are new issues that, that arise. Climate change obviously is not what it was 20, 30 years ago. I'm going to use that as an example. But as issues now evolve, sometimes we don't have the technical capability to be able to address. You know, so is that something you, you help to provide as well, whether in training or just sending the expert, experts, or how does it work? No, Jerome, that's a great question. I mean, uh, as you say, as um, as our cooperation is across various country typologies, so we operate globally in um, least developed countries, in middle-income countries, and indeed in high-income countries. Uh, so there are contexts, regardless of, of level of economic strength, where there's capacity challenges, as you say, in, in various areas, especially if we look to those future issues that we talked about earlier, if we're looking to that futures agenda, there are issues that are not 
squarely you know, at the center of the table yet, but will be in 10 years from now. So building and advance those capacities. So let's take a few examples. Um, building capacities to address issues of loss and damage into the future, you know, as we shift increasingly towards those heavy impacts of, of climate change um, that are accelerating and expanding. Um, expanding capacities, indeed, for reducing, if not reversing, the extinction of species and the decline of ecosystems. That's still an area where there's a lot of capacity. And when we're talking about capacities um, from the United Nations Development Program, our mandate on capacity development, which is at the core of our mandate and our kind of cooperation frameworks with countries, it focuses at a few levels. One is capacities at the systemic level. So there's system capacities. And we're talking about the policies we, in many countries, build new institutions, new agencies, develop the capacities of those new agencies. So as agencies evolve as well uh, to meet future challenges, we provide capacity support to make sure that those entities, those agencies fit for purpose for now and the future. Indeed, at the individual level, individual capacities, as you said, trainings um, and things like systems approaches, foresight for the future, uh, but indeed in some of, the, some of those challenges, even in terms of what we would think of as basics on food and water, for example, how do we really ensure their sustainability going forward? It's not as simple as it looks, right? So there's community level capacities also that we very much focus on. We have a very important, I would say, and strong program over the last 20 years on civil society organizations, CSOs and NGOs at the local level across the Bahamas, um, where we provide important small grants to ensure that their capacity is in place for actually uh, uh, building that community empowerment, youth empowerment at the local level on various aspects of the development agenda. All right, so Crispin, I, I sort of want to wrap it up with you. Mm -hmm. When you talk about providing assistance or advice to government on crafting legislation or helping to uh, to mitigate a, a, a migration crisis, or whatever oh, yeah. we may be facing, uh, these can be very delicate. Uh, because a country may be facing a situation uh, that is calling for particular measures while the UN uh, requires, uh, and the, the things that we are signatory to, requires a particular set of behavior Indeed. or mandates that we behave in a particular kind of way. Right. How, do you, how do you navigate that when a government may be inclined to move contrary mm -hmm. to what they are signatories to or what the UN is is asking them to do or requiring us to behave in a particular way. How do you navigate that when, especially to when you've got a polit political directorate involved as well? Jerome, I think you, that's the question of the day. I think that's what I spoke to earlier when I said that's a unique challenge, not only for the Bahamas, but across the world, navigating that contextually. But I think the important thing to remember is that UNHCR um, is here to support and to find solutions. And that's country by country. We can support by finding solutions, by helping governments with country of origin information. We can help by increasing their capacity to conduct RSD. And that, in essence, protects as well. I think that's something that gets lost in the conversation, that having the capacity to assess protects the borders because then it, 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 it creates an environment where individuals are coming through who may not fall under UNHCR's um, mandate. So there's an element there that's, that's productive and where we're able to assist the government in that regard. But as you mentioned, we are solution-based. We have options for resettlement as well, where we look across to neighboring countries who have an, 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 an increased capacity of another host country. So that's something that we can explore with countries as well. So I think it's more of a collaborative effort and having resources in neighboring countries where we can assist all of them who are signatories to convention. Gentlemen, um, I think that is a good way for us to, to end this discussion this evening. I, again, I, I want to thank you for the work that you do. Um, I know that uh, in a national context, sometimes it can be difficult uh, because a, a national priority or national priorities at the time may differ Indeed. from what, uh, uh, what, what are the, the priorities or what are the asks of, of the United Nations and the organizations that you represent. And I know sometimes that may be a little tenuous situation. Indeed. But nonetheless, we appreciate the work that you do. Where would the world be without 
the United Nations and without the organizations that, that you represent. Thank you. Thank it's you. A good thank question. you, Jerome. Thank you. All right. So thank, thank you very much. Keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. As we close out tonight's episode of On the Record, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to our distinguished guests, Mr. Dennis Zulu, Mr. Kishan Kodar, and Mr. Crispin Hall. Your insight into the UN's critical work in the Bahamas and your dedication to advancing sustainable development have been enlightening and inspiring. To our audience, thank you for joining us this evening. Stay informed and continue to support the initiatives that drive positive change in our community. From all of us here at On the Record, thank you and good night. All right.